Hello, hello, and welcome to this webinar presented by the Peter Jones Foundation. Today we are joined by Lauren Murrell, the co-founder of Buy Sarah London, an innovative beauty company that is changing the way we buy and consume beauty products. Lauren is an incredible and inspiring entrepreneur who shows that you don't have to start out with entrepreneurial ambitions and that that buzz and excitement can come later on. Ideas can come from anywhere and Lauren's story is truly remarkable. Um, a bit of housekeeping before I hand over to Lauren. Um, the webinar is being recorded, so it'll be shared post live stream, but we want this to be really interactive. So after the presentation, we're gonna have a Q&A. So ask questions in the questions tab throughout, say hello in the chat box and um, yeah, get involved. I mean, this is a conversation between entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs. So let's keep it really active. Um, a bit about the Peter Jones Foundation. We encourage education and empower young entrepreneurs and help people realize their potential through business. Um, it has changed so many people's lives. And I'm sure that Lauren's gonna talk about how it's impacted her own life. So really do get involved. Um, and now I'm gonna hand over to Lauren. So thank you so much for joining us today. Hi Katie and hi everyone that's joining. It's a real, real pleasure and honor to be here speaking to you all. So thanks for taking the time this morning. What I wanted to do over the next 20 minutes or so was, was share my story uh, in, in where I've got to so far. And with the, with the hope that you'll ask many questions, you know, as Katie said, I'd love to have a conversation with you and help where I can. So let's jump to the slides. And I've just put a few together. I hope I won't bore you all, but just a few slides, just to sort of paint the picture of, of how I've got to where I've got to. So. I've started with this quote of, I wasn't an entrepreneur in search of an idea. And I, I really wanted to hone this message because I was not that kid in the playground at school, you know, making cookies and selling it to friends. I wasn't the kid that always wanted to have my own business, always hustling on the side. That wasn't me at all. And yet here I am today and I am an entrepreneur. So for those of you that are not sure what you want to do in the future, if you want to have your own business or not, you don't need to have all the answers straight away, but there are certain things you can do along the way that can sort of prepare you for what might come, come down the path and prepare you for the life that you might have, the entrepreneurial journey that might be ahead for you. So I'll share my story and I hope that it helps to inspire within you some hope um, and maybe a bit of resilience as well. And I know the vision of the Peter Jones Foundation is to educate and empower. Um, and I hope through the next 20 minutes or so, you'll get a flavor of, of perhaps what might just be possible. So this is where I am today. That's me and my sister, Sarah, and we're the co-founders of By Sarah London. So we're an organic skincare company that were founded just three years ago. And we've got a picture there of our Christmas gift set. So that image is very, is very happy for me. It's very um, uplifting, but also it's quite a polished image. And you might look at things on social media and think, wow, you know, that all looks so rosy. That all looks so glossy. You know, my life doesn't feel like that. How can I ever achieve that? How do I how do I attain that? And like I mentioned a few minutes ago, I really never imagined this is where I would be today. Let's jump to the next slide. So earlier this year, I shared my story with um, Vogue, uh, The Times and Deliciously Ella on her podcast. And for me, it was a real moment to just really take stock of, of how far I've come. And a turning point for me was lockdown. And I'm sure many of you have been deeply affected on, on many levels by the restrictions um, that COVID-19 has impacted on our lives. And for me, it was a real reminder that I've already been through this in some, in some way. Over eight years ago now, I was diagnosed with a really aggressive form of leukemia and that hospitalized me overnight. And I was in law school at the time and had to go into hospital and start months of chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and then a stem cell transplant from my sister, Sarah. And at the time, I didn't know it, 
but there was only a 20% survival rate. So the, the odds were really, really stacked against me. And it was just really sudden, really fast. You know, didn't expect it to be happen, happening to me. I was on my path to become a lawyer, but other things happened. So I wanted to share my story earlier this year just to give some hope, I think, to, to those that are struggling at this time. Um, because it is really unprecedented what we're all going through, um, but there are lessons that, that can be learned. And in this slide, I've just shared a few pictures of, of what life was like for me. So on the far left, that was me. I was doing a, a charity race for life in Hyde Park in London. So I'm looking really strong, really fit. And within a few weeks, that's me in the middle. You know, I'd lost my hair, I actually donated my hair to charity. Um, connected to an IV that's giving me really strong chemotherapy drugs. And then the picture on the end is a hospital room that I was in when I had my stem cell transplant. And you might just see the far wall, there's a poster on that wall. And that's the poster of the Caribbean. And I mentioned lessons that you can sort of apply along the way. And one of the lessons that I learned was the power of mindset and the power of your environment to shape your mindset. And you might also see in that photo a Nordic cross trainer. So it's the purple upright with the, the black handles, which is not what you'd often see in a hospital room, I have to say. But it was a way for me to keep active as much as I could, even when I was connected to an IV of really strong um, cancer curing drugs. But what I learned in those moments was the power of my mindset to really create resilience and strength for what was an incredibly grueling experience. And more than that, the posters became real beacons for me of the life that I was desperately hoping might come true for me one day. So this period of my life was about two years of being treated in hospital and completely removed from society because I had to be kept in protective isolation for a really long time. But life did get better slowly and I got back on track and I went back to law school, finished my studies and began my career as a lawyer. I started working in London, you might recognise Tower Bridge there, and then I had the opportunity to move to New York. And New York as well was one of the other posters that I had on my hospital wall, just beaming at me every day for, for many, many months. And then on the end, I've got a picture there, and that's in the Caribbean, it's the British Virgin Islands. And you might see the water there is exactly the same color as that poster. So I moved to the Caribbean um, and was able to work there as a lawyer and I had to pinch myself every day that I had somehow managed to get from that hospital bed back to law school and back to the life that I really just dreamed might come true for me one day. And it did, and I was living it, and it was paradise. But then the universe had another plan for me and Hurricane Irma hit the island in 2017. Winds of 200 miles an hour ripped through the island and I was registered by my family as a missing person because they lost contact with me and I was fighting for my life yet again. It was the most terrifying days of my life, being cut off, having to survive um, not one hurricane but actually two. There was another one on track and it was just the most traumatic experience I've ever had. And not least um, because I found out later that the BBC were filming. They actually captured me as I broke down just before I was rescued and evacuated from the island. And that was broadcast on the BBC 10 o'clock news to my family that I hadn't spoken to for almost a week. So it was heartbreaking. Um, and after that experience, I came back with a very broken heart back to the UK. And a quote that I had known for many years really, really sprung out for me again, which is live life as if everything is rigged in your favor. Because the path that I had chosen for myself was just not 
where I thought I would be. You know, I thought I'd be living that life as a lawyer, first in London, then New York, and then the Caribbean, and then it was gone. And so I had to dig really, really deep and use the power of mindset that I had created for myself when I was in hospital to recenter myself and think, okay, what do I do now? And at the time, my sister Sarah had created really beautiful skincare, initially for me when I was in hospital, because going through that treatment, my skin was extremely sensitive and very dry and it easily became irritated. So she actually blended skincare at the kitchen table for me to enjoy and I loved using it. And over the years, Sarah was sharing with friends and family, but still working full time. This was just really her, her passion project, her hobby, if you like. So with the new opportunity of me being back in the UK and me obviously loving the skincare that Sarah created, we thought, OK, maybe there's something here. Let's share the blends more widely. Let's create a business by Sarah London. And we launched it together in November 2017. And this is where we are now. So over the last three years, we've launched a now multi award winning brand. Our organic facial oil has picked up, it picked up its first award just four months after we launched, which, you know, really amazes me even now. Um, last year, we were finalists of the next British beauty brand, um, which was it was very much like a Dragon's Den experience, actually. The, the panel of judges, we had to stand in front and pitch, and they asked us questions, and you know, it was a thrilling experience. And um, yeah, I le learned a lot through going through that process. Um, we've been featured in a lot of press, so that's us in Cosmopolitan and Elle magazine. Um, and we're working with some independent retailers like Wolf & Badger, and we're on Deliciously Ella's web shop. But mainly we focused our business as a direct-to-consumer business. So our um, products are sold mainly through our website, bysarahlondon.com, to our customers in the UK, in Europe, in the US. Um, and we've been awarded a Gold Trusted Customer Service Award, which means a lot because we work really, really hard to keep all of our customers really happy. Um, and our blends as well are vegan and cruelty-free, and we've got those certifications really important for us as a brand to make skincare enjoyable, make it easy to understand, which is why we have a full ingredient list on the front label of every single product. So you know exactly what you're putting on your skin. And that harks back to when I was um, coming through all of my treatment, I had to be really, really careful about what I ate. Um, and that was called being neutropenic because the food could trigger certain reactions within me and leave me quite unwell. And so that understanding of knowing exactly what I was eating, we've brought across to our skincare so you know exactly what you're using, each and every ingredient, um, to really care for your skin. Um, and I've just included a small photo at the bottom, just of me and Sarah there, and that's um, us as ambassadors for the Little Princess Trust. Is the charity I first donated my hair to um, back in 2012. Um, and then we donated our ponytails um, this summer as part of the Buy Sarah Challenge. And all of our social uh, social media community got behind and were donating their ponytails as well. So it was an amazing um, circle of, of, you know, donating my hair all those years ago and then inspiring many others to sort of get on board um, and donate their hair too. So. In a nutshell, that's you know that's where we've come, and I really never could, could have imagined this is where I'd be now. But I think what I've learned along the way is is being open to opportunities and really developing your mental resilience and that muscle as much as you can. And there's a few books I'd probably recommend that are quite useful to help you sort of navigate that course. And something I read when I was thinking about what I want to do after law in London, I have an appetite for adventure. Um, so a book I read was Designing Your Life by Bill Barnett. And it's it's pretty much like a, a, you, have, you have to read it and sort of journal in it at the same time. There's practical exercises that you have to do. But it was the first book I read that was actually a practical sort of step by step. How do you analyze what you're good at, what you're not so good at, where 
what you value, what kind of balance you want in your life. So that was a really helpful book. Um, Ariana Huffington's Thrive, which was a fantastic book. That's where that quote from Rumi really jumped out the pages to me. And then another one, um, Tim Ferriss, he's fantastic. Um, his podcasts are really, really great, has fantastic leaders on there. Um, but his book that I read this summer was Tribe of Mentors. And he interviews dozens of really interesting athletes, business leaders, uh, all sorts of people, and the tips that they um, would recommend to others, those sort of life hacks, if you like. So I have my highlighter out going through that this summer. It's a really good one to read. Um, and then I just, oh yes, and then this quote, we're just building on what I've just said of, you know, lean into each moment expecting magic or miracles. And that applies to business and life because it is hard. Life is hard with everything that's going on with, with COVID-19 and business is hard trying to figure out, you know, what are we going to do next year? What does our plan look like for three years time? But if you create that mindset of positivity, of optimism, um, and really hoping and expecting for good things to happen, I do believe that they do come true um, with those right practices in, in place. And then just a, a, a final slide here, just with all of my details, um, that's my doorbell. Hopefully that's for a neighbor, but if I have to jump, you know why. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's our website, buysarahlondon.com. I'd love for you guys to email me, you know, if you have a question about, or that we don't cover in the next sort of 40 minutes or so, about what it's like starting a business or about organic skincare or anything that I've mentioned, you know, you're more than welcome to drop me a note. Um, you can follow us on social media at by Sarah London, And I'd love for you to enjoy a 15% off discount with Peter 15 as a little treat um, for the Christmas holidays. So that incredibly kind. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to minimize this. We've got some questions that have come in, but thank you so much, Lauren. That was incredible. And I think well, the first question I want to ask, I'll get the, I'll get the question started. Um, myself is it oh I'm just going to minimize this is it um you you talk about um these books that you've read do you think that we need to have kind of physical in-person mentors in our lives or do you think that now with social media with podcasts with um audio books that we can get that mentorship from other places because I think hearing from others like you've shared your incredible story today is so important to make us know that we're not alone that we are connected to to so many people who are going through these the same the same issues who are a lot looking for the same questions how important do you think that is i think you probably need both i mean there's really nothing like that in person one-to-one -one connection but by the same token there are incredible resources online um, and in physical books and i think you probably need a mixture of all of them um and i particularly love podcasts because when i'm cooking i can just pop that in and just really get out of my head of my sort of day-to-day -day and just drop into a conversation um and reading is fantastic as well i read pretty widely but some of the, the books that i mentioned particularly tim ferris they're quite business focused and you just read something and it just sparks something in you yeah. and i'm a big fan of reading and highlighting i don't know if anyone else does that yes, but <laughs> when i flick back through the book you know it's just those moments of okay what did i what was I thinking there? Why did that resonate with me? And something I do as well is journal a lot. I started that really when I was in hospital, I was writing a lot every day. And now I sort of dip in and out of it. But it's a great way to brain dump everything that you're thinking about, put it on a page. And it just sort of complements that idea of mentorship because it gives you on the page a reflection back to yourself of you know really what you're going through what you're thinking about and that might then fine tune okay what kind of person do I need to reach out to maybe I need to listen to more of that or read a bit more of that um so probably all of them together are, are a good good skill set to have and I think we definitely ag agree that it's important to understand what you want to learn before you go out trying to learn it it's you need to have that kind of um as an entrepreneur business either that kind of critical self-examination period where you know there are lots of people who are out there ready to help and answer questions but you need to know the questions that you want answering first absolutely that the ability to ask a personal question you know a really highly relevant question 
cannot be underestimated because you're the answer will only be as good as the question exactly oh great that is very good advice okay so um this is from rachel so thank you for sharing your incredible story you mentioned your mindset driving you forward do you have any recommendations for a budding entrepreneur on how to develop their own mindset hi rachel thank you for your question i think mindset is just so it's so important i i don't think there's one sort of one resource or one book that's going to give you that but i think it starts with really great self-awareness so anything that you can do to get to better know yourself what do you enjoy what do you not enjoy what is easy what feels hard um how do you like to spend your time greater self-awareness is is a great first step and then building on your mindset of looking up like we were just saying for great mentors whether that's in books in person or online and just filling think of your mind like a fridge and you want to fill your mind with the best produce that you can so that when different events happen in your life you've got the right food in there to say okay i know what to do in this scenario or there's a quote there maybe there's something that's really resonating with me what is that lean into that and be be curious about it um, but I think awareness of the power of the mind to propel you forward, to support you when you're feeling low is just so important. So keep going, keep looking into your self-awareness and things that interest you run towards it. And I think we talk about resilience as being like one of the most important things in entrepreneurship. I mean, regardless of how you get your business started or journey until there, there are going to be knocked back they're going to be opportunities but what we think and it sounds like what you you acknowledge from your journey as well is it, it's a muscle and it is strengthened by adversity yeah. so every sort of smaller setback you can you know face the next one with greater preparedness and a great ability to to find the opportunities within within the hardship and, and something as well to think about, there's a lady called Brene Brown who talks yes. a lot about vulnerability. She has a phenomenal TED talk, so I recommend if we can get the link to share that. Yes. Um, and she talks about being in the arena, you know, really putting yourself forward, putting yourself out there. And it's a bit like being a warrior. You know, sometimes you'll be triumphant and other times you'll lose. But by being in the arena, you're, you're taking part, you're participating, you're learning. And that that's the gift you know that's the magic place to be you want to have these experiences and the more opportunities you have whether they're good or bad kind of doesn't matter it's just getting out there having those experiences and you'll learn something if i look back and i'll think maybe um, at university or even at school if i didn't quite get the grade i was looking for i'd be so hard on myself mm -hmm. just so and you just think now i look back i didn't need to be it just didn't matter that much. So it's learning those lessons early and frequently just builds that muscle. I mean, for us, I, I didn't get good news yesterday. It was news I was hoping that would be positive and it wasn't the result we were looking for. And of course, you know, I'm human, so I was sad and I was disappointed, but because of the experiences I've had, I was able to get sort of bounce back quicker and think, yeah. okay, fine, that's happened. Let's put the rational hat on. What do we now do? What do we do next? How do we move forward? And I think having that resilience helps to bounce you out of that low place quicker. And I would say, Lauren, I'm, I'm similar, to, similar to you. I, I think I've had my, my first big failure with my driving test. Um, there were four failures there. And I think what would have helped me is if I had earlier experiences of, of overcoming kind of challenges uh, yeah. at school, you know, from starting a business and then when I was young. Um, that would have helped have some kind of greater perspective and give me the tools to move forward in a more positive way. Yeah, and I think exactly. you can't underestimate the importance of that. So a question from Ruth. Um, again, thank you so much for sharing such an inspiring story. I thoroughly enjoyed listening to you and hearing about, uh, oh, this is, this is a comment, and hearing about everything you've overcome. I'll be buying some Buy Sarah London products for Christmas presents. Oh, so <laughs> Use the discount, Peter 15. Exactly. Thank you so much. Um, and I think this is a really good one from Noreen. Um, she said, I really admire your resilience. You know, what's the future vision for by Sarah London? It's a great question. And 
you know, we're three years in now. And for me, I can't believe how fast the time has gone. I, a year now for me feels like a week. It absolutely flies by. So the next three years are so exciting, <laughs> so exciting for us. We've got a really exciting next year coming. Um, if I just maybe talk to the products, we've, we've really invested our time and energy in innovation. And we launched two products this year that were really innovative blends. So um, one was our hemp infused blemish recovery oil, and it contains upcycled hemp. And upcycled hemp, it, the hemp is grown in the UK, and the seeds are typically used for food products. But if they don't quite reach the right standard, they're typically disposed of and just sent to landfill. And we're working with a partner now who saves those seeds from going to landfill, um, and they rescue them. And over time, the seeds concentrate, and their active, the microactive content increases. So the value of the seeds is even better from a nutrient point of view. And of course, you're not sending them to landfill. So that ingredient is just you know, nature's gift. And from a skincare point of view, it has a greater antioxidant value than its standard counterpart. So we're really thrilled that we're using ingredients that, like that that are really innovative, really sustainable. And we also launched this year our raspberry seed cleansing oil, which has upcycled raspberry seeds. So it's the same principle of, you know, you're not creating new resources. We're using what's already there and saving it from going to landfill. So I'm really excited about those innovations that we launched this year and more innovations coming next year. Um, we've been working really hard on this year. So more innovation, more growth for the business and as well building out our website, our social media community. We have the most fantastic followers on social media at by Sarah London. Um, we love that they get so excited um, about the skincare, about what we're working on. So more of the same for the next three years um, with some more innovations in the pipeline. And innovation is obviously so important, but what do you think about the importance of having a really strong core product line? You know, for you having that kind of five star on the, you know, web trust to be able to deliver well to your customers, have that uh, positive customer experience and the customers then to become advocates. How important is it to get that solidified, the kind of core proposition before expanding? It's so important. I think in in the times that we're in everyone seems to be rushing and running and you know i want to be this big by yesterday and for us we've taken a little bit of a different approach of let's just start with the core and we are primarily a d2c business so selling directly through our website and for us it's so critical that every customer has the best experience possible Absolutely. And we work really hard to make sure that we achieve that. And our, our five-star rating reflects that. And I think to as you grow, the problems are going to get more complicated. And so for us, knowing that we're starting with that strong core is just so critical that then with a business, it's a bit like, um, I don't know, building a house. You've got to start with strong foundations because it's so tempting to think, oh, there's something shiny up over there. Let's go do that. But actually, just over time, you've got to start with the foundation brick by brick and build it up from there. Um, and it's a bit like our skincare as well. We've been extremely deliberate in what we've put out to market. It's a very streamlined collection. Um, to make skincare easy, accessible, you understand it, rather than just flooding the market with excess products that you don't understand, they'll trigger your skin, it just goes to landfill, and it's just not a good customer experience on a product level. And often, I think what people need to realize is that there, there's an attraction of the new and a kind of pursuit of the new, that sustainable business growth is often slow business growth, where you have got the practices really um, streamlined and you can sustainably build upon that without losing anything else. And it is, it is important to have, you know, if you've got a direct to consumer model, I think we look, know, or we all know that if you're a small business, it's a lot cheaper, um, to, you know, to maintain your margins and to go direct to consumer. So therefore your website has to be top notch. Um, your fulfillment has to be really good and the product has to be fantastic. So 
grow slowly upon your foundations. I think you can have long-term business strategy, but don't get distracted by the what's next, what's next. I think you mentioned something that just triggered a thought that's, that's really relevant in there. The different elements to a business, you know, the website, the fulfillment, the manufacturing and, and the product. There's so many different elements. So for the, for the young people listening that not quite sure what you want to do in life or where your skill sets are, I'd say keep your skill set as broad as you can. So that you're giving yourself that um, that resilience, if you like, actually, that you're building those different skill sets, whether it be um, talking to a customer or organizing orders or thinking about finance, thinking about marketing, any different type of experience that you can have, doesn't really doesn't matter what it is, if it's stacking shelves, you know, that's a great job, that's a great opportunity to learn. Or if it's working as, I don't know, a receptionist, or if it's working as, I don't know, an Uber driver, you're gonna learn something in each Absolutely. of those roles that you just never ever know when that skill set is going to be relevant again, particularly in these times. We've got no idea what the future is going to bring. But one thing's for certain, it's not going to look like this. The rate of change is so fast. And me and Sarah say this frequently over the last three years, how quickly the social media landscape has changed, how quickly e-commerce, how quickly skincare is changing. The rate is getting faster and faster. And to keep afloat, you have to keep your skill set varied and flexible and be curious and keep learning because if you stay in one track there's the fear that you could become redundant well they, they call this being a t-shaped person so the the long bit so the t is your really varied skill set which you need to have before you go into a specialty i like that yeah, yeah. so it's keep it keeping keeping your skill set varied being you know and when you're when you're a business owner you have to do everything you don't start off with a large team around you. You have to be the creative, the accountant, the um, fulfillment manager, the procurement person, often the per person going to the post office as well. You know, it, it's exactly it's keeping that team really strong at the at the hat, and then you know later later on um, focusing on the specialty. But you know that specialty because you have that varied skill set set can always pivot um, if new challenges arise. So a couple more, um, quite a few more, but this is actually something which you just touched on um, from a student at Leicester College, um, emailed it in and said, what barriers did you come across and how has the pandemic affected your business? So kind of pandemic related, mostly sort of over the last nine months, how has that been a problem? I, I guess that actually the direct to consumer and having a strong e-commerce model helped you rather than hindered you. Yeah, that. I think that was um, the right decision for us to focus on our e-commerce business. So from that point of view, we've been in a strong position. But the last few months have just been so, so challenging because we set out to serve our customers and we want to deliver the best possible skincare that we can. And at the start of lockdown, when all of this was happening, Sarah and I really just slowed down and we're thinking, OK, what's happening? How can we make sure that we can still deliver our skincare and make sure that they can still enjoy their skincare rituals? Because when things are really uncertain and you feel a bit shaken, to have things that are a comfort to you, like your skincare every day, is so valuable. So we wanted to make sure that we could still make sure we delivered our skincare. And for us, all of our skincare is handmade in the UK, um, whereas other big name brands, perhaps that's not the case. In fact, I know that's not the case. So for us, we were in a really strong position that we could continue to deliver our skincare to our customers. And like that was a godsend that we were able to do that. From a communications point of view, we really thought, how can we serve our community beyond just the products? And there was a few things that we did. Um, one of them was we gave a discount to frontline workers and NHS staff um, to help them through that difficult time. We also started a WhatsApp group, which is still going now, which I love. It's so fun. People just share you know, really fun quotes or that they're enjoying the skincare and it's, you know, international community of people. 
So that's been really fun and really positive. And I think everyone in the group's actually got something out of being part of it as well. Um, so that's been really great. And then another thing we did was support um, the Little Princess Trust, the charity I mentioned. So they had to stop receiving donations during COVID, which obviously had a huge impact on them. So Sarah and I thought, okay, how can we help them? And maybe there's a way for our community to support them and spread a little joy at the same time. So this is where our By Sarah um, Ponytail Challenge came about. And Sarah and I kept growing our ponytails. Our hair was so long. Um, and then we donated it to, to the charity in September. And as I mentioned, some of our community did that as well. And it was just a really positive way to bring people together, support a fantastic charity, um, and just put a positive spin on what's just been a really weird, horrible, crazy, yeah, really. <laughs> unnerving few months. So that's sort of how we got how we got through it. I think power of community is so important. And they always say it's a lot cheaper and better to retain a customer than it is to recruit a new one. See, recruitment is really important to grow your audience, but you want people to feel that they're part of something. And now more than ever, people are looking to buy into brands that stand for things, that stand for something, that they trust in, that they believe have a purpose and a purpose that aligns to their own. So, I mean, what an amazing way to create a community that is still so active. It's also been incredible, as you said, about connecting people, about connecting your community. Um, and Chris asks, what strategies do you use to gain traction on social media platforms like Instagram? It's and how, how's that been beneficial? Because, I mean, lots of um, small small businesses that don't have big advertising budgets, that kind of organic social reach is so important. Yeah, it's, social media is hard. Social media is really, really hard to get cut through. Um, the approach that Sarah and I have taken is to just show up and be ourselves. Um, so if you take a look at our feed, you'll see a lot of us doing um, skincare Q&As or showing how to use the products or interviewing some of our favorite people or showing some of our favorite people in our community um, and just showing up as ourselves because that's the best way we can show who we are behind the brand, how the products work, and looking for people that share our values. So someone like Deliciously Ella, she's a huge advocate of our brand. You'll find us on her web shop. And I think others like to see our products in places where they also shop or other people who they follow. Um, and that's a great way to sort of um, give that assurance that you know we're a brand you can trust. Others love using our products and trust our skincare as well. Um, up until now, everything we've done has just been organic. Mm. Um, we haven't put money behind huge advertising campaigns. We're still a small business. Big vision, big plans for the future. But right now, you know, we are still a small business. It's only very, very recently that we've started to invest very moderate sums in paid advertising. And we'll see how we get on with that. Um, it's hard. The algorithms, you know, really like to eat your money and um, it can be a bit disheartening. But, you know, we are in, in this digital world now and it's so important that we reach our community and others through social media and um, just a small amount of spend behind that. Hopefully we can reach more people um, because that's that's what we're up against now, you know, an online business we rely on people finding us or spreading um, through word of mouth. And bigger companies now that traditionally perhaps wouldn't have invested so much time and money on these platforms are now doing so because their retail shops are dead or dying. So it's even more competitive. It's even harder for small businesses like ours. Um, but, you know, we'll keep showing up. We'll keep going. Um, and hopefully in another three years time, we'll keep growing it and keep reaching more people. And, and for small businesses, the most important thing is that you're buying into the people who set up those businesses, the entrepreneurs and the stories, which is what makes small business powerful compared to sort of a large conglomerate, which can often be sort of faceless. You don't you, you don't really know what you're you're buying. If there isn't a sort of a brand ethos. You don't have strong affinity, love with that brand because, you know, it's it's sold by a conglomerate and it's bought by 
millions of people around the world. You know, you've got a transparent brand. You've got your products right in the front. How important do you think that your brand story is um, and you and Sarah's kind of role as co-founders is to your brand? I think it's important on, on several levels. I think from a business point of view, it's so helpful because we are the left brain, right brain between us. Sarah worked in the industry for over 10 years at Estee Lauder, Unilever, L'Oreal. So she knew the market, she understood the products um, and she's highly creative. I'm, I'm creative, but much more the lawyer brain um, to the business. So that left brain, right brain, brain synergy is, is really valuable. In terms of the story to the brand, I think, like you mentioned, you know, we're so transparent about who we are and our products. And I think that helps people to connect with us. Um, and that's great in, in these times, you know, you're looking for that connection. It, more than ever, you know, we're isolated at home for a lot of the time. And so looking for why someone has done what they've done, like why should I invest my time in, in them or their products? I think that helps. Um, but more than that, the products really do stand, stand up for themselves. They are fantastic blends, multi-award winning blends, and they deliver results. So I think if our story was strong, but the products weren't, maybe we wouldn't be having this conversation. But the, the, the stories there and the products really do speak for themselves. I've actually got one here I want to show you. So this, oh, is, the, this is the hemp one. Um, you can see all of the ingredients on the front label. And this is just a great one. You know, if you're suffering from acne or mast knee in these times or even hormonal acne, just a few drops um, just applied to clean, slightly damp skin really does help. Help the skin. It's packed with anti-inflammatory ingredients it's really high in antioxidants and they're really really beautiful blends and then i mentioned earlier didn't i i've got my um the raspberry seed one that's an upside mean, for raspberry seeds in there so the branding and design how do you i mean this is this is a, a big thing for because you've got beautiful beautiful products with a really um kind of clean strong theme going throughout they look like they're a part of a, a family which is you know critical they need to be identified as by sarah london products how do you get started with that? I think that's something people have this idea, but creating a brand, you know, going from product to brand is quite a big leap. Yeah. So for you, where, where did that where did that start and how did it get going? Did you have some sort of quite dodgy early iterations where you well, thought you were going where... to with a different a different name and a sort of um a bells and whistles um, packaging? Well, this is where to go back to my very beginning slide you know i did not set out to be an entrepreneur mm -hmm. this is why the business is called by sarah as well to some degree because they're sarah's blend they're still all her own formulations um so that her own blends and i remember many many years ago brainstorming and seeing her sketching it all out but i was really not part of it at that point because I was sort of doing my own thing. I was part of it in the background, but I was like, I'm still a lawyer. Like, how can I help? I don't really see any value I can bring here. Um, so Sarah was still sort of doing it in her own track. It's only when I came back to the UK and we were like, okay, maybe we've got more of a business idea than we thought we had. And with the both of us together, we can really grow a business. I salute any sole founders you know, it's really hard to do it by yourself. So um, coming together, you know, it was a perfect, perfect marriage. But Sarah was the one that led all of the, still does primarily, the design of how she wanted to bring my story to the front of the labels, um, knowing exactly what you're putting in your skin, keeping it really, um, keeping it clean mm -hmm. with a sort of a little bit Scandinav Scandinavian design, you know, yeah. that, that clean aesthetic and as well, they're completely gender neutral. We don't yeah. use fragrance. We don't use essential oils. They're perfect for both women and men. Um, and that's quite unique in skincare as well. You don't see a lot of that. It's targeted yeah. like this is the female cream, like the male. Uh, so yeah, both men and women enjoy our skincare, which is great. And also important because I think you can either have a very niche audience as a brand, and be like I'm targeting these people, or you can have a brand that, can be accessible by everyone it's an access a, a competitive price point um it's you know gender neutral it's 
you you can go mass, but the people who are still buying into that are buying into it for a reason, and they're buying into your products for the reason of that that they're transparent, that you're per you know transparent ingredients, that you're purpose led, cruelty free. And I think what we what we see now from all the data about Gen Z and who they're buying is that that is so important. That is yeah. influencing their decisions. And do you feel that you were were lucky, or it was more hard work that you were early adopters of that before it became like it is now, and um, almost a prerequisite? Is there someone starting up a business in in beauty or in fashion or in something else that that transparency? and purpose is now you know almost has to go hand in hand with a business plan it does it does i mean for us it was just our values that's yeah. you know who we are as people and of course we'd reflect that in the brand so choosing organic plant-based ingredients making sure the brand is certified cruelty free making sure the vegan products are registered with the vegan society but of course that's what we would do um, but you have to be aware of, of the broader trends as well. And of course, that's what we're all demanding. I'm sure many of you would have seen the documentary on Netflix with David Attenborough. Mm -hmm. And you know, you have to be aware of the world that we live in and we all have a role to play. Um, even if it's just a small thing of you know, looking for more plant-based options, whether it's in your diet or in your skincare, those positive choices, we can all make them every single day. And we should be making as many of them as we can. Um, so it's so it's so important to keep keep your values front and centre, but be aware of the broader trends um, that you're aligning yourself with those as well. Well, they call it the MVP, Mission Value Purpose. That they are central and critical to any business. Who you are, what you stand for, and what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we're just going to have one last question, which is a piece of advice. So we work with young entrepreneurs from across the country. And we believe that naivety is at their strength. Not knowing, um, you know, not knowing everything is not a hindrance. But it'd be interesting to know, what are you, what's your piece of advice to an entrepreneur getting started? If you knew how, how sort of hard it would be when you, when you um, got going, would you still be where you are today? I think... It's going to be hard, but do it anyway, because that's where the growth is. That's where the excitement is. That's where you're, you know, you're anxious and excited at the same time. Is it going to work? It could work. It might fail at the same time. Like that's really an exciting place to be. The alternative track is one of comfort and safety. And obviously we need a degree of that in our lives. But if you're ambitious, if you want to make change, if you want to inspire change in behavior um you have to look for those opportunities to look for those hard moments like we were saying earlier you know step into the arena stand up for what you believe in and have a go sometimes it will work sometimes it won't but at least you're tried or you're trying um and i think that's that's what we're all here for you know you've got to stand up like use your voice um for what you believe in and give it a go and growth often comes from the most uncomfortable places whether it's um like you know personal or it's a frustration in your business and why you're trying to overcome that frustration that's where we see those opportunities so i think it's like a don't give up carry on going um we're capable of so much more than we think we are absolutely always. and i think this year has probably proved it um for everyone it's like you know what you don't think you can overcome it well here we are nine months later um everyone's still moving forward um so I think that's great advice. And Lauren, I cannot thank you enough for your time today. I've really, really enjoyed this. Um, you are an incredible entrepreneur. And I, I truly think it's so important for people to hear that you don't need to go out there with an idea from, you know, day dot. This stuff comes later in life. It can, it can manifest, it can change. And, you know, we can go into careers, continue to take the learnings from there, start a side hustle, our ideas can come later, and then you can you know, move forward with drive and determination at a different point. Our journeys are different, we're all on different timelines. Um, it's important not to compare your, with where you are now to where someone is at the other side of the country, at the other side of your school or classroom. We're, we're doing things in our own way, in our own time. Mm -hmm. And you've proved that. 
And on, how does entrepreneurship compare to law? <laughs> In some ways, it's very similar. You know, um, some of the the skills that I picked up, um, you know, managing time and deadlines and responsibility, all of those sort of broad topics is still highly relevant in what I do day to day. Um, but I'm my own boss now, which I would never change. <laughs> so that's the best part. And I get to work with my best friend and my sister. So um, yeah, I wouldn't change it for the world. <laughs>